Greetings fellow Earthlings and welcome to this tiny garage. Welcome back everybody. Now some of you may be wondering, with good reason, what in monkey's buttocks has been going on? Well in short, I bought this 911 pre-broken on Craigslist and with your help I was able to rebuild the engine. Then unfortunately 300 miles into the run-in I was trying to fix the transmission and I broke it. It was at this moment that he knew. He f if any of you know what a reverse lockout is and how to fish one out of a Porsche transmission, please let me know. Regular viewers will also know that I was the lucky recipient of a spinal cord injury halfway through this rebuild process and around the time of my transmission snafu, the medical folk told me that I needed to stop doing life for a few weeks so they could prod and probe me at will. I did make some videos while in the medical penalty box, including one from the Biltmore Hotel, another one on how to make a teleprompter, and then a Porsche news episode using that teleprompter. So now that we are back in action, we do need to get that transmission off the engine. But as we'll see, we've got a couple of other issues going on. And while it sounds crazy, it's gonna be easier just to take the whole engine and transmission combo out. And before we do that, we're going to check a few things on the engine with the Dura Metric. That's right, folks, we've got a Dura Metric. When you buy a Dura Metric, you get a box with this dongle in it. The software is free, you're paying for the dongle. The USB end of that dongle is plugged into this steam powered IBM ThinkPad that I found in a very dusty cupboard. As luck would have it, Windows XP and this car both came out in 2001. And while it is only available for PC, you don't have to use a steam powered laptop. It will work right the way through to Windows 10. Sadly, we don't own this Durametric dongle. It was kindly lent to us by subscriber Joby Tapia in Mill Valley, California. Thank you, Joby. And so here, before we take the engine out, I want to just see if there is anything juicy that maybe we should fix when the engine is out. The quick scan came back with no fault codes relating to the engine, a couple of codes relating to the central locking synchronization, and another one about the blower fan that we kind of already knew about. Next, I'm gonna to try to find that actual values section that we went over with Stacy in episode 54. And here we go, he's actually talking real time to the car. Here you click a checkbox and it'll bring whatever you've selected up as a real-time graph on the screen. There I was just taking a look at the mass airflow sensor output, but you can also look at things like the engine altitude correction factor, engine intake temperature, engine compartment temperature, oil temperature, the camshaft deviation, actual camshaft angle, actual throttle value, and the rough running index that we're gonna take a look at. I also checked for misfires. That was something that was really bad when we checked the car at Stacy's house and there were no misfires whatsoever. According to the laptop and all the sensors, at least, the engine seems to be a fairly happy chappy, no check engine light and no obvious signs of impending doom. You rock, Joby Tapia in Mill Valley, California. Here is that rough running index. 21.5 seems to be the number. More of a straight line than the jagged line from before. Also, no misfires whatsoever this time. Something that was troubling is right at the end. This came up, the solenoid valve for the carbon canister. Hold on, what's the dog doing? Oh yeah, subscribe now. Delta says thank you. While that fault code is most likely referring to the carbon canister solenoid in the passenger wheel well, this regeneration valve is the other end of that system in the engine bay. Both the carbon canister solenoid and this regeneration valve are easy to get to with the engine in the car. But seeing as one of you kind folks sent me a quick way to test this little thing, before we disconnect everything, we're gonna do that. Give us the beans, Kelsey! All right, sure thing. 
When this regeneration valve opens, it allows excess vapors within the fuel system to get sucked in and burned up by the engine. What we're testing for is if the valve is stuck open. In that case, it will allow vapors into the engine the whole time, causing the engine to run rich. I'm told that if the valve is stuck open, you're going to feel suction on your finger, presumably from the engine intake, but the instructions weren't clear, so I did test both ends. Okay, coming up. I tried it plugged in, I tried it plugged out, I tried shaking it all about, I even had Kelsey's saxophone the living jeepers out of it. Not a sausage. I then decided to put my big boy pants on and bench test the regeneration valve with my new Ansel diagnostic leak tester. Thank you, Sally and the team at Ansel for sending me one. I do have a full review of this gadget in a future episode for you diagnostic leak testing fanatics. The 12 volt battery is running the diagnostic tester and then the 9 volt battery held on with my thumb is running the regeneration valve. Switching that switch easily starts and stops the smoke. I tried it both ends. Whatever the problem is, I don't think it's this. We're going to move on. A problem that certainly has made itself apparent in the few weeks this car has been sitting is not one, but two oil leaks. The first one here on bank one is from the cylinder head cover, right there on the join in not one but two bolt positions this one here also seeping very slightly because we made videos of this entire ordeal i believe i have footage from episode 44 showing the offending moment while it looks okay there is one small area that is not continuous oh dear Moving over to bank two then, the cylinder head cover does seem to be holding tight, thankfully. Bank two's major malfunction appears to be with this rugby ball shaped solenoid seal. We can see that more easily if we take a looky up here. In short, it's not sealing. We have some undeniable seepage. Those oil leaks can be fixed with the engine in the car, but if you add the transmission issue and a couple of other bits and pieces that we'll talk about as we go along, it's just easier to take it out. I would like if you would hit the like button. Thank you. Have you ever had your AC system evacuated by a professional? Me neither. Those are the hands of a professional, by the way. So you got a high pressure and a low pressure. Low pressure is the blue one. High pressure is the red one. Chris is sucking out all the refrigerant so we can leave the AC compressor attached to the engine. Also, it means we don't have to get a $25,000 fine from the feds for doing it the naughty way. There it is, I had 1.13 pounds. It's supposed to be 1.85 pounds, which is more than a Suburban apparently. Also, I learned that the low pressure hose is always the fat one. Thank you, Jabo the mechanic. This is officially our second rodeo. It's much easier to get the engine out if you take the wheels and the bumper off. If you want all the gory details, check out episode two. Would you like some help selling your commercial apartment building in the San Francisco area? Contact Joby Tapia in the comments below. Before we drain the oil, we need to warm up the oil one last time. Chelsea, fire it up. Okay, coming up. Just got it up to temperature there and then we're all ready to drain the oil. Kelsey can chillax for a bit. Yeah, put the lift down there, make our life easy. Got the strainer going. I was wondering why the engine oil was so black and then I remembered Graphagen. Graphagen, tell them Wonder Woman sent you. And then I found a big goose poo sized lump of it on the sump plug. Probably no harm done. I'm sure it has done its job. I am happy though that we are now draining this run in oil and we're going to put in the permanent fancy stuff. Changing out the oil filter as well. Of course, that was black with graphogen juice as well. This is just your regular paint roller tin. I stapled in some pleats in some kitchen paper to try to catch any juicy morsels if there was any. 
Despite my initial fears, all the debris I found were little tiny clumps of the graphogen itself and then one piece of the Loctite 5900 sealant that seemed to have made its way through the oil system. Check out episode 5 if you'd like to see the first time we did this. Moving on now, we're draining the coolant and this is kind of like episode 6. Deja vu. Not taking off the AC compressor had a huge beneficial knock-on effect and saved a lot of time because you didn't have to remove the serpentine belt, the bolt for the AC compressor in the back, the awkward one. There was no need to remove the fuel cooler from the back of the AC compressor. All kinds of stuff that ended up saving a lot of time. All of that stuff is covered in more detail in episode 7. Here we're removing a bunch of suspension items from underneath the car, just like in episode 8. The rear axle cross brace, lower subframe, stuff like that. Opening the garage to disconnect the AC compressor there, just so that Freon juice doesn't kill me. Another significant difference from when I first disconnected the transmission in episode 9 is I didn't remove any of the transmission brackets or supports. Yes, this transmission bracket. I was able to save a bunch of time by just taking out the two bolts that go through the transmission mount itself. The first time I took the engine out of this car, it took a very stressful three weeks. Mercifully, this time it took less than three hours. <sighs> Thank crikey. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time. <laughs>